So today we have here the co-founder of Riverglade, Anthony Marcano. Welcome to Romania. Welcome at Centric. Maybe you want to tell us more about your background and afterwards we will have some questions for you. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's been amazing just seeing the energy at Centric, um, the the desire to learn and, and grow, but also have fun in the process. I started working in IT in the, in the mid 90s and uh, stumbled onto an extreme programming project in the year 2000. And I was like, yeah, this has all the answers that should solve the kinds of problems that I kept seeing in the previous, in the earlier years of my experience. And so I made it my mission to just be a part of XP projects. And then about a year later, the uh, the term agile was, was coined and wrapped around many of the different methodologies from XP, Scrum, um, Crystal Clear and uh, many other methodologies that were around at the time. By the mid 2000s I was one of the few people in the UK that actually had real hands-on experience that I said, could say yeah I've had experience of five years in working in, in agile teams and on agile projects and so that resulted in me um, sort of getting hired into sort of help kickstart some of the XP practices within new teams and then I happened upon a project where um, uh, an adjacent project happened to have someone called Rachel Davies working there. She wrote the Agile Coaching book. She was on one of the first um, uh, XP projects in the UK uh, in 1999, uh, the Connextra team, which came up with the story format as a I Want So That. Uh, she also came up with uh, things like um, using constructors for dependency injection. Um, but she was very much uh, in the sort of area of coaching, and I learned a lot about coaching from her. Up until that point, I think maybe I was maybe um, not so much coaching, more mentoring um, and maybe some leadership uh, and I really learned about coaching and I was inspired by, by what I could do by coaching teams and then I ended up being one of the few people with coaching experience um, and having worked alongside someone of that, of that calibre um, was obviously uh, held me in good stead and I spent a lot of my time since then either working uh, as a practitioner on a team so, uh, or as a coach. But I usually have quite intense periods of at least three to six months where someone says, we've got to get deliver this project. Can you just join our team and work with us because you've been coaching us, but we actually need you as a practitioner. So then I actually get to go in and, and feel the pain. Not just, you know, on this project I worked on 10 years ago, on this project I was on recently, here were the time pressures we encountered and here's how we still maintained our disciplines and still maintain quality. I can actually talk to that in a, in a real context in a real sense. So that's a key part of my my sort of ethos to, to remain as much a practitioner as a coach. Can you tell us more why the behavior driven development is the answer since you had the talk today about this topic? Yeah so today's talk was much more focused in on one very small part about of BDD which is the the scenarios uh, that people write and how we can use that to um, pull the conversation in a, a constructive direction that's helpful for, for all team members, including product owners and, even, and, and the end users. BDD is a much broader topic, of course, and I would never say it's the answer. Um, I'd say any practice, technique, or even broad, more broadly, whole methodologies are ideas that are uh, that of, a, of a, a particular solution that was relevant at a time as it was explained but it's a collection of ideas that we can draw upon and see which of those ideas help us solve certain problems today. And I think it's important to understand the, the key elements of the practice and the challenges we're facing uh, and, and only try to adopt as much as we can of an idea as much as it solves the problems, the challenges that, that a team's facing. I think one of the big mistakes teams do is they treat BDD or Scrum or test-driven development, which to me is essentially BDD, but by a different name, um, you know, or extreme programming. And they take these things like as a template and they drop it in and assume, well, that will make everything work. Any new methodology, new practice, new technique, always try it as an experiment on one small thing. So let's say you've got, you know, five different things you're working on as a team, probably too many things at once anyway but let's say you are 
then, then pick one of those things that you can say, you know what, this is small enough that we can actually try this practice because it's a new skill. And with a new skill, it's better to start slow and get it right and be good at it. And then with practice, you get faster and faster and faster. And by doing it as a small experiment, then you'll, you might not know what kind of challenges it will solve, but you're trying it as an experiment. You learn something about what challenges it solves. And then having had that experience, you can start to see, ah, here's how we can start to apply it across everything that we do. So I'd never say it's the answer, but it's an answer. Uh, when it's a good approach to use behavior de development and when it's not, I assume it's not doable for every project in an organization. I think there's a lot of context to take into account. Um, one of them is the skills available in the team. So if nobody in the team has ever tried BDD in any form before, then that might be um, to try and just take it on in one go might be not such a good idea. But again, start with small experiments, build up experience. One of the main challenges that I think, you know, BDD as a whole helps us solve, um, if we think about it in terms of both the customer test from the outside and working our way from the outside in down, even including the unit test loop of red green refactor, is as a whole, um, it's addressing a few things. And one of them is um, helping us uh, get a deeper understanding of a problem that someone else has brought to us, often. Uh, so there's often the talk about you know, a customer who has an idea about something they want the product to do or has an understanding of a problem a user has and then we try to understand that by expressing that as a series of examples. Um, that might be, um, uh, that, that might, even if you're practice and skilled at it, that may slow you down uh, to, to put something together as an experiment and get it out into production. And uh, a colleague, um, an industry colleague, um, who I'm sure you've heard of called Ken Beck, who came up with extreme programming, test-driven development, etc. He has this concept called 3X. And in 3X, um, he, he talks about uh, three phases. Explore, expand, extract. You know, when you're in explore, uh, it's all about experimentation. And actually, you want to experiment as quickly as you can. And this is where you might be trying out multiple different features um, and you know only each feature tried with maybe a, a small percentage of your users if the use that the uptake and the feedback's good you might uh, keep it if it's not you switch it off you try another experiment so the speed at which you can experiment with feature ideas is is high and maybe you don't even know what the problem is that they have yet you're just throwing features at them until one of them sticks and then you start to figure out what the problem is and expand that's when the demand from for that particular capability uh, or even a whole product, um, literally just pulls you on. You have no choice but to run with it because uh, the, the, the rate of growth is now beyond control. And at that point, there will be some things that, okay, now we really need to start wrapping these parts up with some tests because they're gonna be fundamental to us surviving this period. And there might be other things that you're still experimenting with. And then when you get into the extract, that's when you're just extracting the value. You're, you're at a point where, oh, right now, you know, the demand is leveled off. Um, this is a staple part of our revenue stream. We need to protect that revenue stream now. Now, at this point, um, perhaps people are bringing, uh, so perhaps someone has, has an ownership role, a product ownership role, and they're bringing you the ideas that they want to try uh, and you want to try and get an understanding of it, at which point it becomes you know, extremely valuable. So the circumstances in which it might not always might, 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 um, might be less useful is when the speed at which you want to experiment with features is faster than the speed at which you can write your understanding down. But when protecting what you have is more important, then I think the, the value of it is, is even higher. But there are many different parts of BDD that we can use, which don't necessarily mean, you know, uh, expressing the test in, in an automated fashion. So there might be some things that could be beneficial. And with experience, you'll start to see where that's useful and where it's perhaps more of a hindrance. Can you name some advantages of using behavior-driven development? Absolutely. Uh, if, if you're in an environment where, um, you know, the, the team is um, uh, trying to, to understand a particular problem that a user has or that a product owner has proposed that the user might have. And you really need to make sure that, um, that, that you want to try and minimize the number of um, unnecessary iterations 
So the product owner might say, oh, here's what I want. You go off and build what you think they said, and you come back, and then they say, well, that's not really what I asked for. What I really want is this, and they tell you what's wrong with what you've just done. And then you go off and you iterate again, and you come back. And you might go through several iterations. Um, by having a conversation, so for example, and then you just write down a few words very concisely. For example, uh, if this happens, would this be the outcome? And they can say, no, that's not quite what we meant. So you can, you can iterate more quickly around a set of examples. And then the value of having those automated is that as that's been agreed and you've got feedback and everyone's happy, they become, they protect that uh, functionality from, from unexpected or unintended change. So when you are changing other things and something over here breaks, you, you find out pretty much straight away. Yeah, so you suggest involving the client as much as we can in the beginning of the process of development, Absolutely. not only at the end, so you, we need to share uh, those scenarios too with them. Yeah, and I think there are times when, um, when you have the customer involvement like continuously, and if you can, you know, you, you, you have the conversation, you sort of say, you, you write it down together, this is kind of what we think we mean, and it's a very collaborative exercise, and then you'll kind of go through the, the inner loops to get that scenario passing, you'll get some feedback, and then you'll work on the next scenario, great. But not every team has that, that luxury. Um, some teams, they'll see the product owner for an hour on Monday, and maybe an hour on Friday, and in between, they're too busy. Uh, so sometimes you, 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 you may have to work in a more asynchronous way where you might have to write a bit more down, uh, show that, email that to, to them or arrange, I prefer to arrange a screen sharing session if they can't be there, even if it's for 15 to 20 minutes, just to talk them through our understanding, the, the examples that we've come up with based on the understanding we took away from the last conversation we had and, and get that kind of input. Um, so there are times when, uh, when you know, you do want the customer involved all the time, but uh, you can't always have it every minute of the day. But, but um, little and often is usually better than in big batches. You know, if you have it, you know, have days of their involvement at the beginning and then you don't see them again for three months, uh, that's really a recipe for uh, disaster. I guess what happens, you know, that's basically a waterfall project. A good colleague of mine said once um, that uh, all, all waterfall projects go agile in the end because uh, what happens is uh, people will start using the product, they give you feedback, they put it in a list, which is called a bug list as opposed to a story list or a backlog. They prioritize it ruthlessly. You do frequent releases, fixing one, uh, small batches of those at a time and you get more feedback. And you keep going through that loop until eventually the product is accepted and it can go, in, go into production. So rather than save all that up for the end, you just start that, 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 uh, that process from the beginning. Yes. Besides being a coach and a trainer, you also were involved in writing books. Uh, can you give us some recommendation and any resources for those wanting to learn more about BDD? Mm -hmm. One of the more recent books that I would say is uh, a very val valuable resource in terms of BDD is uh, the Cucumber book. And although it's focused on a lot on Cucumber um, as a tool, um, I would say that a lot of what's explained and the process and the mindset and the thinking uh, actually is as much about BDD. You, you could almost rebrand the book as a book about BDD that happens to use Cucumber to illustrate BDD or the other way around. Also, the what's affectionately known by some of us as the Goose Book, or the, it's called Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Tests. Uh, and that's another really, really good book um, that uses language that's more closely associated with test-driven development, but essentially shows the same, the same process. I'd say that it's, it's, the, it's the modern explanation of um, TDD by some of the best practitioners uh, in that. Um, on top of that, I think there are a number of other books, um, um, ones that I've been particularly specifically mentioned in. For example, one of the first BDD books, I would say, was Bridging the Communication Gap and, uh, by Goyka Adzik. And, um, um, he talked very much about um, uh, communication and examples, but again, it was branded at the time as acceptance test-driven development. But the, the, the principles, the model, the approaches, they're all very much valid, whether you call it BDD or ATDD or TDD.